Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Nilush Karup Singh, cardiologist from Ambara. Today, I'm going to discuss uh, an interesting case of a young cyclist. So the chapter one, there were two brothers, both are cyclists. The younger brother is 36 years, software engineer, and married for eight years, but no children, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, and no significant family history. So no one broke your asthmatic with good control, and his hobby is cycling. So he cycles like nearly 20 to 30 kilometers per day regularly. And the elder brother is 41 years, civil engineer. He's a non-smoker, he doesn't take alcohol, married and having children. Again, no significant past medical history. So they both do cycling. So elder brother, he cycles around 100 kilometers per day. He's kind of a professional. The younger brother is just for hobby, 20 to 30 kilometers. This is the first hit. Elder brother, he started to getting chest pain, right side atypical chest pain for one week. He went to a cardiologist, ECT, non-specific changes, echo normal, troponina negative. But with the high suspicion of the chest pain, I don't know why right side chest pain, just atypical chest pain, the cardiologist decided to go for an angiogram, which reveals severe LAD disease. So he underwent PCI to LAD. Now our young brother is cycling So it took us about three months to get the permission from the cardiologist to do cycling again for the elder brother. But for oh, not for 100 kilometers, just 20 to 30 kilometers. What happened next? So they're cycling again happily. So this is a tragedy. So elder brother, he was very confident and defaulted after six months of PCI. Even though he says he took medicine, we don't know 100% about the compliance, but he stopped seeing the cardiologist. So he's cycling 100 kilometers daily. So it started to get angina after one year of PCI, but he continued cycling, didn't seek for medical advice. And one fine day, he had a severe angina while cycling and got a cardiac arrest and died. So postmortem revealed, lucky for the cardiologist who put the stent, failed a previous LAD stent, but left main total occlusion. So as we know, left main total occlusion, even though you resuscitate, the chances of survival is very less. So he had the cardiac arrest on the road. So there were not no uh, no uh, qualified person to resuscitate even. So next chapter comes with the fuel crisis. Now our younger brother, he has no fuel. So he stays at home, works from home. I given up cycling. Why? You want, don't want to get killed by cycling? So he given up cycling and he's depressed on his brother's day. So next chapter. Started to get central tightening chest pain and shortness of breath and insomnia. And nocturnal sets recently. And his inhale has been put. So, by looking at his brother, he, he decided to go for a cardiologist. First visit to the cardiologist. He took an ECG, there were no skin changes, troponin I was negative, and the cardiologist thought could be bronchial asthma in the situation because he gets symptoms, dial variation was there, night symptoms, sweating. SOP, fatal chest tightness, and all. But he tried to exclude ischemic heart disease by doing an ECG troponin. But no improvement. So this one again decided to go for the cardiologist for second opinion. Again, the cardiologist took an ECG, no ischemia, troponin, IOCP, and negative. And he suggested psychological counseling. The wife was saying that he is get, he can't sleep in the night, he's sweaty. 
and if it's palpitation, shortness of breath, and everything, those would be, you know, he's in the period of bereavement after brother's death. So, the differential diagnosis here at this point, the cardiologist who saw the patient, this differential diagnosis was first one was angina, considering the family history. Second one was exacerbation of bronchial asthma. Third one was depression with anxiety. Then, what happened was he got deteriorated and he decided to go to the local hospital and he came to the emergency department. He has central chest pain and shortness of breath. Examination is very sweaty, tachycardic, tachycardic, blood pressure was low, saturation 90%, lungs, there were few bronchial. And ECG was taken again on this IUS tachycardia, properly naive is positive. So, initial management would be oxygen or face mask, nebulization back to back, and subcutter was applied here. So, this is the due management. So, the differential diagnosis here was exacerbation of bronchial asthma and anxiety. If everybody was concerned about the brother's death, condition got deteriorated and asked for cardiac disobedience. What he did was he did an echo. There was severe RARB dilatation, severe TR, and severe pulmonary. Now you know what the diagnosis is. But what happened for the past two to three weeks? Because of his past medical history, uh, because of his family history, his brother's death, so there's a strong risk factor in the family, and central chest pain and shoulder suffering, and being a very active man and a cyclist, how could he get a pulmonary embolism? So that was the worry that uh, the emergency physician had. So he his logic was. So there are strong his family history and probably naive positive, even though there is RA RV dilatation, could it be RV infarction? Yeah, can be RA RV infarction also can present with RA RV dilatation, CADR, ECG unless you get a VFR, you can use it, but usually. Uh, what happens is RV infarction alone is very rare. You should take it up and with the nuclear MR. With the RCA, some RCAs give uh, many branches to the RV, but some there's a single huge vessel, RV marginal branch, which supplies the RV. So, occlusion of the RV marginal branch only can cause RV infarction alone. But usually what happens with proximal occlusion of the right coronary artery causes RV infarction and interposterior changes. So his, his logic was modified based criteria. He says it's he is unlikely only that he can is there. But there's another one. Pulmonary embolism security index. This is simply possible. So it's very high, but this is very non-specific. You see. Oxygen saturation, even heart failure, you get these symptoms of 90%, heart rate, 100, more than 100, and systolic blood pressure is low. But with high suspicion, and the patient is deteriorated, the echo findings are very consistent, so we decided to thrombolize at that point. Otherwise, we miss the patient. So, the, now the different shield diagnosis, the pulmonary embolism comes in the picture after the echo. So, we then the thrombolysis study. What are the options available? The RTPA is the recommended one, osteotomides. So, to finance, we know the successful percentage is 50 to 60 percent, but RTPA and RTPA is more than 70 percent. So, he thrombolyzed the patient and then went for the CTCA. Yes, you can see in the CTCA there's a saddle thrombus. 
sitting in the main parliamentary artery, occluding both right and left parliamentary artery. The 2019 guidelines of acute parliamentary alcoholism. So, what are the options? RTPA, streptokinase. We didn't have RTPA, but streptokinase, you know, the success rate is very low. So, we decided to give it a place. Is there a place? Yes. But it's not approved. The next place may be considered for high risk of massive parliamentary alcoholism. High risk of massive is defined by sustained hypertension or cardiac shock. So the treatment dose is at the same as the demand. Now what happened? Now the patient is in ICU and he's, that he had an initial improvement, no sweating, blood pressure stabilized without hydrochromes, but saturation remains low, RARB remains dilated, pulmonary hypertension is still there, and he has started enoxaparin and homopoly after 12 hours. And because of the anesthetics, body and says it's failed to overdosis. Patient is not improving. So we repeated the CTCA and the radiologist report was same as previous. No resolution. Now, this is the recommendation. If the patient is not in the highest room, that is, you know, pulmonary person. Hemodynamic is stable, then you go for heparin. But patient's condition is, you know, blood pressure low, saturation low, and patient is in high risk group, then the systemic thrombolytic therapy class one. Surgical pulmonary embolectomy is recommended in whom thrombolysis is contraindicated of weight. And the anticoagulation, now we started warfarin and enoxaparin. So initial, uh, initiation is recommended without delay to these patients. So low molecular weight heparin is preferred in most patients. Oral anticoagulation started in patients with PE, eligible for NOAC. And NOAC is recommended in preference. Now this is the important NOAC is actually preferred than the vitamin K androids that, that is warfarin. <clears throat> when uh, you know the enoxaparin, when you started uh, warfarin, it has to be combined with the enoxaparin. And NOAX, NOAX, what are the contraindications? In renal impairment, severe renal impairment, during pregnancy and lactation, and antiphospholipid syndrome. Why? The warfarin can be monitored by INR. But most of the times, NOAX is very expensive to monitor and pseudo it's, it's very difficult in our setting. So, NOAX patient, we give them the dose, recommend the dose, and we expect it will work. But in antiphospholipid syndrome, you can't. You have to be 100% sure that it is the recommended dose. So, in antiphospholipid syndrome, up to now, NOAX are not recommended. In pregnancy, and lactation is not studied well yet to give a conclusion that's safe. So uh, the worry was whether this is fair thrombolysis. And the patient party is also very uh, not happy with the patient condition. So actually we uh, contacted the government hospital to assist their system and they are Problem was patient was given the natural which is thrown after yes, two to twenty four hours on warfarin and and also money who can't go for it on his surgery. So better to wait and see. And the patient party had actually had enough funds, so they contacted the private sector and the cardiothoracic surgeon in the private sector accepted the patient for thrombolytic term. So patient went to the private sector and they are they have repeated the CPC and this is day three. And they are also promising sign. What is that? The saddle thrombus is still there, but there are some partial recanalization. So hematologist was called him and he said, Don't operate, he will die. We will manage him medically for the time being and see what happens. 
So remove the band 20 milligram DD as a double dose. And uh, in Oxybari, therapeutic doses. So remove the band 20 milligram DD is, I think, it's quite convenient. Uh, there's no evidence like giving double dose remove the band in this setting. So in that time, we have done the initial investigation. You know, in the acute setting, thrombophilia screening, complete screening is not done as useless. So the basic things we did, ANA was negative, and cardiology is negative, full blood count, ESR, CRP, DVT scan, or um, plasma homocyte level, so it's negative. Then, we the duration of antibiotic duration. It's usually, as we know, in the cervical course, it's three months. And if it is, if, uh, if the course is not found, or it's not a reversible course like antiphospholipid syndrome, it's long term. And uh, the following everything with all these uh, things. The patient actually started to improve after one week. That is, he's maintaining saturation without oxygen, blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory stable, echo remains safe. Echo remains still are ARV dilated, severe pulmonary hypertension. But the hematologist and the cardiologist and the physician are likely to discharge the patient on. Enoxaparin therapeutic dose now all together one week given. Additional week that is from the home as our patient. We were also the double dose, multi micrometer DD and percentile 62.5 that is for the pulmonary hypertension, C pulmonary hypertension three times. And the inhalers. So after two weeks, Enoxaparin was discontinued. We were also banned again. Came down to usual dose, 20 milligram mass daily, losing my 40 milligram BD and position 62.5. Now the now in the echo is CD pulmonary hypertension. So the recommendation usually in pulmonary embolism, the routine clinical evaluation should be done by a you know very qualified person after three to six months. And the echocardiogram should be done. If you have the facility, CDCA should be repeated. So, echo became normal actually after three months. He was lucky. I have a similar patient like this, and he was treated by cardiologist again. And sorry to tell you, and for three months to asthma. And after three months, we did the CDCA, this pulmonary embolism. We did the uh, uh, and we gave the kinetic test from the slide, lungs, and after one month, the CTCA is normal, but the echo is, a, echo is similar. And he now, what she has is a condition called the uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension that has been established. established. So, you can't treat that, so the patient can't afford Bosentan. It's on Ciladenafil, now it's about two years. Still, the condition is same. So, echo became normal after three months. Repeat CTCA didn't show in terms of persisting pulmonary hypertension since it was very fresh, acute thing. He settled. So, Bosentine was discontinued after three months. Rerox band was discontinued after six months. Right. Now, what happens to the cyclist? Now, as given up cycling. Because of brother's death, now he was like immobile, but now he can't. So our advice was to run or do something, walk even. Now he found his partner, the new partner, his wife. Now they are jogging and running, so he doesn't even look at the bicycle. So this is the end of the story. So the high, uh, the key points are. In your differential diagnosis, even though the patient is a cyclist or whatever, you have to go and you have to infer and get a good history. What is he? What was he actually doing? So this work from home and uh, sitting uh, inside a laptop for twelve hours.
of the day without getting up, it just came afterwards on normally of inquiry. So everybody thought the patient was a cyclist and active and young. And how could this spiral person be? So that is one. And the second one is always in young patient with SOB, tachycardia, uh, ECG and you know uh, property in life can be misleading. So echocardiogram has to be done. So we could have been picked up. I mean, at that point. The third one is once you diagnose the pulmonary embolism, if you have delay, clinical diagnosis, if you have delay in performing CTC, you get a thrombolysis. Fourth one is so in failed thrombolysis, always there's an option for either surgical embolectomy or a catheter guided uh, aspiration. Uh, then finally, after uh, thrombolysis and all, after about three, you should give about three months time to get the right side of the heart to come into the normal shape and then go for a repeat CTC and if the PTP is okay and then uh, the heart remains severe pulmonary hypertension, then you should consider treating us chronic thrombopoly pulmonary hypertension and investigate on that and put the patient on percentile of serotonin and follow up the patient. Thank you.